All right, thank you very much, Dr. Weissmiller. Uh, you'll notice a couple things. One, I didn't write managing arrhythmias, and, and some of that is just a, a semantics issue, but an arrhythmia is a lack of rhythm, dysrhythmia is a problematic rhythm. I will tell you also that at least from experience and the feedback that we get from our residents who take the, the board exam every year, most find that the arrhythmia type questions and even the cardiovascular questions are fairly straightforward, fairly reasonable, typically not ones that are designed to trip you up. Disclosure statements, still nothing to disclose. You can read over learning objectives. We're going to talk about dysrhythmias. If you knew nothing more about the coronary or the cardiac conduction system, have at least this bare picture in your mind. And a few important elements. The SA node, sinoatrial node, sits high up in the right atrium. Technically, it's actually not like a node, like a little nubbin of tissue. Uh, one of our electrophysiologists pointed out to me that it's more like a region of pacemaking activity. But nonetheless, we still call it the SA node. Further down in the atrioventricular junction is the AV node, in essence, a little area of slowing between atrial depolarization and ventricular depolarization. That exits down to the bundle of Hiss, which then breaks to the bundle branches. Remember, the right bundle is just the right bundle. It goes over to the right ventricle. The left bundle branch itself is actually fairly short because it quickly breaks apart into both an anterior and posterior fascicle. And then the, the further, the kind of the distal conduction system is the Purkinje fibers. Remember, when we're thinking about coronary anatomy, uh, coronary artery anatomy versus electrical uh, anatomy, the AV node is most commonly supplied by the right coronary artery, which also supplies the inferior wall. So in your mind, connect an inferior MI with the potential for AV ischemia and AV conduction abnormalities. Anterior wall is all supplied by the left anterior descending artery. That also supplies the distal conducting system, the Hisperkinji system. Uh, so be thinking about that as we answer the next questions. So first question. So this is a 52-year-old male who is a uh, avid tennis player and has a blood pressure of 154 over 86. Past history is benign. Given this rhythm strip, and I'll let you look at it more closely, which one of the following drugs would be inappropriate to use in this patient? So you can back up and look at the little rhythm strip, and then when you're ready, come forward to decide which of these would be inappropriate. I know Dr. Weissmuller pointed out that all these questions are patterned exactly like they will be on the board exam. This probably will not show up as such on the board exam. Because options are A, dehydropyridine calcium channel blocker, B, non-dehydropyridine calcium channel blocker, C, beta blocker, and D, cyanide. Which of these would be inappropriate to use? Forty percent are saying, forty-two percent now are saying that cyanide would be inappropriate which means that over 50% of you are thinking that cyanide would be appropriate. Hmm. Be cautious when you're answering that question. Cyanide is never a good option, even if it's uh, somewhat ingest. So what was on this rhythm strip were two things. One, it's a little harder to read the, the rate because it's hard to see the, the big boxes there. But this is a rate less than 60, so a baseline sinus bradycardia. And also, if you look close, the PR interval is prolonged. So we've got sinus bradycardia with a first-degree AV block. Both of these can be seen in a description of a patient like this, someone who has a higher level of physical conditioning. And the most important point here is that neither one of these is a contraindication to any antihypertensive drug, assuming that it's otherwise indicated. If a beta blocker was indicated for this patient, then you would use a beta blocker. If a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker or even a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker was indicated, you could use it in this individual. A first gravy block or a sinus bradycardia are not absolute contraindications to any class of drugs. Question two, and I'll leave this up for just a moment so you can look closely at this rhythm strip. We've got a 52-year-old man with COPD and hypertension who has worsening fatigue. He denies chest pain or shortness of breath. Exam is notable for a slow, irregular pulse. Lungs are clear. Current meds, lisinopril, chlorthalidone, tiotrobium, and aspirin. So take a look at that rhythm strip and see what you think. Because the question is, basically, what is this? All right, based on this history and rhythm strip, what's the diagnosis? So options, we've got A, a blocked PAC, or premature atrial contraction, B, Mobitz type 1, second degree AV block, 
whether it's type 2 second degree AV block or a third degree AV block. What did you see on that rhythm strip? Most are going with a Mobitz type 1 second degree AV block. There's a bit more thought on a second degree type 2 and even some consideration of a third degree AV block. Well, this was a second degree type 1. And if you look closely at that rhythm strip, you will notice a couple of things. One of the hallmarks to, of second degree AV blocks is that there is a gap in the rhythm strip. You were expecting a QRS complex to be there, and it wasn't. And so our job is to say, okay, what happened? Why, why were we missing? Why was there a, a block? Why was there not a QRS complex where we expected it to be? So looking back at that rhythm strip, if you look closely at the PR interval, you will see that the PR interval gradually lengthens more and more and more until finally there's a P wave that doesn't conduct, and then the process resets.